Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dean Pribino. I'm Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of the Faculty. And it's my great pleasure on behalf of the Elmhurst University community to welcome you to today's Genevieve Stout Intercultural Lecture. And in particular, I'm delighted to welcome our guest lecturer today, Dr. Gail Wallachak, who is a professor of radiation oncology and radiology at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. Uh, you need two business cards to fit all of that on it, I think, probably. So welcome. We're looking forward to your comments today. Um, in addition to welcoming you to today's lecture, um, I'll be brief, but I also want to take this opportunity to recognize and lift up our celebration of Women's History Month and the many programs and activities that uh, tend to happen throughout the month to recognize the contributions and achievement of women here and internationally. And I think it's appropriate that the International Women's Day actually falls on today, uh, March 8th. It is, it is today. And um, certainly here at Elmhurst University, we have many powerful examples of women strong who provide strong and transformative leadership and meaningful contributions uh, across our campus, both in the past and presently. And I believe we are all better off because of them. So uh, thank you uh, to, to all our, our women and our, our contributions here on campus. You know, hosting lectures that challenge and engage our thinking like this is a hallmark of higher education. And at Elmhurst, I believe uh, in my three years here, I think I've learned that we do this particularly well. Um, you know, I think it's important that we have these lectures that don't just, that they just don't happen. And I think it's important to recognize that. We just don't all show up and things happen. It takes a lot of planning and a lot of thought that goes into picking relevant topics and speakers. And then it takes uh, speakers who are willing to come and join us in their busy schedules and, um, and engage our minds. And so for that reason, I'd also like to just take this opportunity to recognize uh, Dr. Mary Kay Mulvaney, Dr. Maladin Turk, uh, Laura Murphy, Daniela Barca, who I know, uh, along with the people who they consult with in this process who, who put together all the efforts that, that, uh, that make the today possible. So if you could please join me in recognizing and thanking them too. Please. So I'm sure that today's talk, which is on radiation accidents, uh, incidents, and archives, uh, will be sure to challenge, and I jokingly said possibly scare us a little bit, and that might be okay too. So it uh, kind of gets the creative juices flowing when we are presented with these kinds of concepts. And so once again, I'd like to welcome our, our guests today and welcome all of you. And at this time, I would like to uh, turn it over to uh, Susan Swart Steffen, who's a professor emeritus and uh, the retired director of the A.C. Bueller Library. Uh, she is here to do as she always does, which is to help us understand the legacy of Genevieve Stout. So Susan, please join us. This one, right? Thank you. Um, every year in March, we pay particular attention to the achievement and impact of women on our history and on our world. And we reflect particularly on the shoulders of those who came before us. So for us, that's having the Genevieve Stout uh, his, Women's History Month lecture. So why did Elmhurst University name its Women's History Month lecture after Genevieve Stout? All the other ones are, are named after people um, who everyone in the world knows, but only we know who Genevieve Stout is. So I want to make sure we really know who she is. Genevieve Stout was a member of the faculty and administration from 1931 to 1961. She came to Elmhurst as an education and a history professor, and shortly thereafter became dean of women, and in 1948 became dean of students. During her 30-year tenure, she also served as the head of the education department and advisor to elementary education students, because women never do one job. They, we always do many. From the beginning of her time at Elmhurst, she showed great dedication to education, uh, and to working with students. In her letter of acceptance to President Timothy Lehman, she closed with the following statement, I'm eager to measure up to the standards that you have set for me, but even more to the ones I long ago set for myself. Jane, as she signed many a letter and was always called Jane, was at Elmhurst for a specific purpose and was determined to do her job well. Dean Stout's le legacy to Elmhurst is Best summarized by President Robert Stanger, who commented at her retirement, modest and unassuming, her gracious and per gracious personality was an outstanding influence on campus. Her integrity, her straightforwardness, her sincerity endeared her to those who knew her. She was firm and yet kind. As a teacher of teachers, she had a lasting effect on generations of Elmhurst students, whom she recalled by name long years afterward. In the community of Elmhurst, she made a real place for herself in educational and cultural circles, 
and she had a host of friends and admirers. As the story of Elmhurst is written, one of its very bright chapters will be the story of a wise and gracious woman who helped to shape so much of what it is today. There's not an overwhelming amount of material in the shoddy archives about Dean Stout, but in her reports to the president and board, she's quite revealing of her values and attitudes towards Elmhurst and especially its female students. She certainly did not hesitate to speak truth to power, and I assume in person she was probably even scarier than in this report. Um, colleges can do much, she said, in offering training for young women that will make them inspire them to glorify the making of a living into the making of a life. A perennial problem related to enrollment of women at Elmhurst is the curriculum. Women came to this campus in 1930 and were offered a program of studies that had been developed for men's students in general and pre-professional programs. The worth of the program is undeniable, but with women comprising approximately 60% of our enrollment, it would seem that some extensions peculiarly, peculiarly appealing to women and equally cultural might be introduced. Seldom does a young woman matriculating in Elmhurst fail to ask what she can do when and if she graduates. This, as this quote shows, she was a practical person and she understood that women were enrolled in Elmhurst College because they wanted to be there and it and could just as easily not be there if Elmhurst could not create something of value for them. For me, the legacy of Genevieve Stout is also personal. As a child growing up on campus, I knew Jane Stout. She was a formidable figure who dressed in what her faculty colleagues called various shades of black, but she also took an interest in the faculty kids, especially the girls. When I was about five, she invited me to visit her on my own. Just me, not my little brother, and not my mother. She lived in Schick, she cooked on a hot plate, and she had a television. She was cool. She came to pick me up in her big car, and I got to sit in the front seat, because we did that then. She cooked me grilled cheese on her hot plate, and we watched the Mickey Mouse Club on her television. We didn't have a television, but, but I was, you could listen to Mickey Mouse Club on the radio at that time, and I was an avid fan, so I scheme for weeks about which day of the week I would get to actually watch on television. It was thrilling and exciting and very grown up. It, and I think she knew how important it was to give me this confidence boosting special treat that I have remembered for a very long time. And she also gave me an early lesson in women helping other women that has stayed with me all my life. So we come back to the question, why did Elmhurst College, name, Elmhurst University, sorry, na name its Women's History Month lecture after Genevieve Stout? I believe her influence in changing the curriculum, the campus, and the culture from a German-based young men's institution to an American co-educational college cannot be ignored. Hence, we remember Genevieve Stout each year during Women's History Month, and we honor her lasting influence by bringing women to our campus who have also made a difference. And we will we'll now... Uh, Dr. Trick will welcome our speaker. Thank you, Susan. It is my privilege to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, as I prepared uh, this introduction, Dr. Walashik asked me not to go over everything I wrote there. And it is truly difficult to introduce someone like Dr. Gail Walashik because of her numerous accomplishments. Uh, so Dr. as we heard before, Dr. Gail Walashik is professor in the Feinberg School of Medicine, Departments of Radiation Oncology, Radiology, and Cell and Molecular Biology at Northwestern University. Dr. Walashik received her BS from Youngstown, uh, Youngstown State University and PhD from the University of Toledo. She completed her postdoctoral training at the Mayo Clinic and then moved to Argonne National Laboratory uh, where she was until 2001. Dr. Walashik's research is focused on two general areas, radiobiology and bio-nanotechnology. Dr. Walashik is the author of about 250 peer-reviewed scientific articles. She serves on numerous, uh, in numerous leadership positions in scientific organizations in her field, and, it is, and she is a frequently invited speaker at major scientific conferences. She holds numerous patents, and uh, we are really glad that you could be with us here tonight. So thank you for being here. Please help me welcome Dr. Gail Walsh.
Thanks to Maladin. Thanks to everybody. Uh, this is a beautiful campus, beautiful students. I've had a really great day today so far. Um, enjoyed the luncheon discussions that I had, and I'm just impressed with the overall kind of ambiance that exists at this uh, university. So thank you so much for inviting me. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, tell you about half of what my lab does. Um, we've been working in this area for a very long time, but I'm not going to tell you all those stories. I'll try to shorten it down and make it be somewhat, somewhat interesting. But I do have my email address here for anybody that might want to um, email me with questions later. I'm happy uh, to talk about it. Um, OK, so what am I going to do? I'm going to talk about natural radiation background in the US, which we are all exposed to. I'm going to talk a little bit about Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the dawn of the nuclear age. And I need to preface that by saying that I'm actually on the advisory committee for the Hiroshima and Nagasaki studies that are done with the Japanese atomic bomb survivors and how they've influenced the way we think about radiation protection in the US and around the world. And then I'll talk about archived data sets and some sample issues that we've uh, gone after. So here's the radiation map of the US. Um, where it's blue is where it's low radiation. Where it's here in the magenta color is where it's very high radiation. This happens to be where most of our uranium mines are in the US, out here in this uh, uh, area by Nevada and uh, New Mexico. And then uh, where it's you know, kind of greenish is where it's moderate. And here's our own city, Chicago and Elmhurst, here in this uh, little mix that is not quite so exposed. Um, what does this tell us? This tells us that uh, our radiation, that, that the places where cancer is the highest are the areas where radiation is the lowest. And so therefore, radiation is not the major cause of cancer in the US. Um, and here's just another map that shows the absorbed radiation dose. Now, um, these are some of our uh, things that contribute to our radiation exposure um, in, in the US and across the world. Um, first of all, that we have about half that comes from medical exposures. So get a CT scan, uh, you know, get, get a chest x-ray, that's a medical exposure. Half of the exposures in the US come from that. And the other half comes from our natural background. And of our natural background, a good percentage of that is from radon um, that seeps in through the soil, through into our basements, and we breathe it in and we're exposed to it. Now, I'm not going to talk about it in great detail, but Mars also has a radiation environment. And one of the things I work on is uh, the space environment for astronauts and whether they have a r higher risk or a lower risk when they go up into space. Um, I'll mention that a little bit in, in a little bit for why that's important. But uh, you can see that there is an, a radiation environment in Mars that is very, on Mars that is very different than what we experience here in the US and is going to be important for astronauts. This is um, the, uh, a plot of our radiation exposures. And these numbers are going to be confusing to you, and I don't care that you remember any numbers. But I will say the following things. That it, this goes from 0 to 1. This goes from 0 to 10, 0 to 100, 0 to 1,000, 0 to 10,000, um, 0 to 100,000. Where are our, our environmental exposures? they're down here in this range of 0 to 10 or 0 to 100. Our medical diagnosti diagnostics, like chest x-ray, like CT scan, are 0 to 10. Where do we start to get severe radiation illness? It's up here in this 0 to 10,000 range. And up here in the 0 to 100,000 range, this is where our, we get treated for our radiation therapy. So the range of what we're exposed to from our environment is very, very low. It's orders of magnitude lower than what we have from our medical exposures and much lower than what we would get if we were going to be in a radiation accident of some sort. All the same, and here's just um, another uh, diagram that shows the same thing. But what we know about most and what we learned about most from radiation exposures is from the Hiroshima and Nagasaki incidents that happened. These were not accidents. We deliberately bombed Nagasaki and Hi Hiroshima. And 
the exposures were so great that they caused that very high, not the highest range, but the second highest range from zero to 10,000 for exposures. People died from the radiation exposures. There was acute radiation sickness. There were many problems. Studying this population is how we have learned about what, what happened with radiation exposures. So here's a map right here. I go to uh, Hiroshima at least once or twice a year. Here's a map where the um, hypo center of the bomb was. You can see where the bomb dropped. This happens to be Nagasaki, where uh, it was extremely populated. It was also populated in, um, in, 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 uh, in, in um, Hiroshima. This is, a room, this is a view outside my hotel room. And you can see here's where, about where the bomb dropped. What do you notice here? You notice that there are mountains around Nagasaki. Those mountains protected, Nagas protected the rest of Japan, but they hurt Nagasaki. What happened? The bomb dropped. The radiation landed there. The mountains kept it in Na Nagasaki. People were very badly exposed. But it went, had it gone, had there not been mountains there, it would have spread much more over all of Japan. So Japan was sort of saved because of those mountains. Mitsuo Kodama is a man I met, actually. He wrote this book. Um, I met him in Hiroshima. And he was exposed to the bomb at a very young age. He was about seven or eight. His school was bombed. He has since had approximately 20 different cancers from his radiation exposure. His family all died. He wandered through the streets of Hiroshima looking for somebody for three days before he found people he could stay with who would help him. It turns out his sister also lived um, through the bomb, um, but the stories that they tell are amazing. What to me is the most amazing is that I sometimes think that they're going to be angry at Americans because of what we did, but he isn't. There's no bitterness. There's no, there's no anger in him. He, hugged me, kissed me, and was happy to see me just like other people that he knows. Um, I think that a lot of the efforts and problems that came about as a result of the dropping of the bomb have gone away because of the, um, because time has passed. Now, I love this picture. This is actually called the Gadget. The Gadget was one of the first atomic bombs that was dropped. You can see a person uh, sitting here. You can see the size of it. But look at the wiring in this. Uh, modern day no nuclear bombs do not look like this. Um, they are very tiny, uh, very, very controlled. Um, but uh, this one was, was very big. So here's the Nagasaki bomb uh, dropping, blowing up massive um, uh, damage. And here's a picture of the damage that was done around Nagasaki. What, what do you notice? You notice that there is very little infrastructure that remains. The infrastructure means that there were no, because of the lack of in infrastructure, there were no hospitals. There were no places to be able to take people. And so what we have in this particular incident is the unusual situation of a large population of people that were untreated for radiation. So when we look at the population from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we know that they were untreated for their radiation effects for many years, it, at, le at, least, at least for many months, rather. It took them several months before we were able to get aid in to help them. There was a lot of denial about the radiation sickness that uh, occurred. And, um, and so we have these untreated cases. Most of the other incidents and accidents that have happened since, for instance, Chernobyl, there were hospitals that were available. There were people that were treated. So there's a difference, actually, in how people respond if they're treated with, for the radiation sickness versus if they're not. So some things we learned, uh, or that we know about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, was that a uranium bomb was dropped in uh, Hiroshima. Plutonium bomb, bomb was dropped in Nagasaki. Uh, what the Japanese thought was that we had many more bombs sitting around. They didn't know these were the only two bombs uh, that we had. And that probably influenced the end of the war. This is probably the most important point I can make. There was a, a treaty that was developed between the US and Japan. And the treaty said that we promise to study the population to help you treat and to help learn from what we did. So the, even today, I'm on the advisory committee for a facility that sits in Hiroshima, the purpose of which is to continue to study this population. And so everything we've learned about 
most, some, among the most important things we've learned about radiation, they come from studies of this population. There were 200,000 people that were exposed, and they have been followed throughout their entire lives. They were followed through pregnancies. They were followed through many other things to understand the effects of radiation. Um, and so the survivors, their children and grandchildren are being studied today. We're not seeing so many effects in grandchildren that are different than what we saw in the children, but we continue to, to do that because it's part of the treaty. So aside from the acute effects, probably the most important are the incidents of can the, the case of cancer. So I have to show you some data. I'm a scientist. Um, these are old data, but they're very accurate. Um, not, not done by my own group, though, done by uh, Dale Preston. This is looking at the risk of getting cancer against the dose of radiation. These were from the Japanese atomic bomb survivors, and these are total cancers. So what you see is that as the dose went up, the risk went higher. As the dose come da came down, the dose got lower, but there was a point when the risk went back up again. We still don't understand why they're, they're, this came down and went up again. These bars here are the error bars in the data, which says that perhaps it's due to error bars, but it's not certain. When does cancer pop up after radiation exposure? For most solid cancers, excluding thyroid cancer, it pops up within 15 to 20 years after and continues to be high risk for the rest of your life. It does come down, as we show here, but it, does, it doesn't come down to zero. Now, they also looked at the leukemia incidence, and this is kind of interesting because uh, the leukemia incidence, leukemia is one of those tumors that pops very early. It starts maybe a year or two or three after, uh, uh, after exposure to radiation, unlike solid tumors. And the problem, of course, was that we didn't start to study this population until way later. So the incidence of leukemia, these are the data we have, but they're very old data, and we haven't been able to look at it in another, in another way since. So this brings up the dilemma that we face in modern radiation biology. This is the biggest, most controversial issue. I will tell you that we have arguments about it at, at almost every meeting I go to. And what, what it comes down to is if you look at the excess cancers against dose, we know about what happens above a particular dose. That is those hundreds of doses. We know what the risk of getting cancer is with dose. But below that, we actually don't know. There were not enough people that were exposed. There aren't enough incidences of cancer to be able to calculate it. So some people say, well, a little bit of radiation is, uh, is worse than a lot of radiation, and that this curve follows this super linear line. There's some other people that say, you know what, a little bit of radiation is good for you. Go sit in a radioactive spa, lap up those rays, because you're going to get a, your immune system stimulated. And in fact, you can go out to uh, Colorado, Montana, and find some radon mines where they sell for 20 bucks the chance to go sit in the mine to get your immune system stimulated. I've seen these. Um, and in some areas, like in Serbia, there's a place called Nishkabanya, where there are, where, where there are radon, there are radon spas where people sit there to get exposed to uh, radiation. What the US government says is we actually don't know what this looks like. And so they say, we will follow this linear non-threshold model where we extrapolate from high doses down to low doses, and that's what we will use. This is not set in stone. France follows this threshold mechanism. Canada is leaning toward a threshold mechanism. So it's just very, very controversial. We don't have much data down there. What does my lab study? We study what happens at these low doses, and even harder, what happens at low dose rates. So the Japanese atomic bomb dropped in one moment. Everybody got exposed for one moment. But how do you all get exposed? How do I get exposed? A little bit every day, a little bit every day, a little bit every day, a little bit every day. And it looks like that's a little more protective to get exposed a little bit every day than it is to get it all in one pop. How do we figure out how protective that is? That becomes a very big question. So these are um, some of the things we learned from um, Japanese atomic bomb survivors. I'm not going to mention all of these, but I'm going to focus on a couple. As you decrease the dose rate, you also decrease the risk. What does this mean? The dose rate is related to risk. That's going to be important to us. 
Um, the other thing that was important and is important for the NASA uh, astronauts is that the female is more likely to develop cancer than the male. You want to think, oh, it's mostly breast cancer. It's not. It's lung cancer. And so now, when NASA's thinking about sending astronauts into space, what do they do? F say to women, you can't go because your risk of getting lung cancer is too high on International Women's Day, an issue to think about. The women astronauts said, You're not, you can't do that to us. It's not fair. So we had, I was on a committee that made the decision that they're going to hold men and women to the same risk and protect men to a greater extent in order to keep women protected. But I'll tell you something strange about the data, and that is that the only data set in the whole world that shows that women are at a higher risk for developing cancer is Japanese atomic bomb survivors. You don't see that in other data sets that exist from other accidents. So I wonder, you know, Japanese women don't underreport how much they smoke, and I wonder whether the incidence of lung cancer in Japanese women may be because we're including a lot of smokers in that population, whereas we excluded them for the men. So we will see what the future brings. Um, it will be important. So here's the aspect of it that, I, that, that, that my lab works on. At the same time that the atomic bomb work was going on, what, the, what happened in, in, in the US was they set up a large number of animal studies to understand radiation effects better. These animal studies, they included, now think about this for a moment, 49,000 mice that were done here at Argonne National Lab down the street, 24,000 dogs that were done at six different labs all over the US, 30,000 rats, a large number of monkeys, some burrows, some pigs, large number of, of animals. All of those tissues from those animals, or most of the tissues anyway, sit in my own lab. And the data sets from those tissues are also in my own lab for access. We think that it's important to have the data sets and the tissues together. So if you have any questions about the data set, you can go back to the tissues. Now, why was dog so important? Mice. They're not really good models for humans, but because everybody studies them, it made sense. But the dog was studied because dogs, for some reason, have radiation responses that are just like humans. They get the same leukemias that we get. They um, die at the same doses that we do. And my own theory is that environment probably makes a difference. Dogs watch our TV shows. They eat our food. They do all the things we do. They live in our environment. And this might be an example where environment makes a difference. Around that same time, there were a lot of groups doing many different archives. Um, my, my, one of my students did a study of the different kinds of archives that exist and found that there were um, multiple sets. There is even a Frederica um, data set that comes from radiation ecology studies. Um, so this became very popular. Our own radiation archive is called uh, NURA, the Northwestern University Radiation Archives. Um, it includes the animals I mentioned. Um, it includes studies from 1951 to 1996, which is when they stopped. It's a mix of radiation sources, so we have some that were exposed outside their bodies, some that were exposed by what they took in to their bodies, either by breathing it in, by eating it, or by getting it injected into them. Um, the, a lot of them were external beam sources, but some were radiation that is, is particulate, and there were multiple delivery routes. Where were these studies done? A large number were done at Argonne National Lab down the street. Um, some were done at Colorado State. Some were done at Oak Ridge National Lab down in Tennessee. Um, some were done at the Inhalation Toxicology Research Institute in New Mexico. Some were done at U University of California at Davis, Utah, uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab in Washington State. So you can see that they were done at many different places. And we've collected these archives from all these places into, into one, one place so they can be e more easily studied. Um, and this sort of gives you an idea. Uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab collected some of them, we collected some of them, moved them, and they now become part of our uh, archive. 
Now there's another probably interesting aspect that I need to mention about this. At the same time that the US was doing these studies, guess who else was doing studies to understand radiation effects? Russia was doing studies. And most of their studies were done in a place called the South Urals Biophysics Institute, which is just outside, uh, which, which is near Siberia, okay? So I've gone there a couple of times to visit their facilities. Um, here is a picture of uh, my team visiting with the uh, Russians. Here is their little sign telling us that they have radiation danger. Um, I will tell you that this is also the site of all of their weapons construction for uh, Russia, and we were all, um, when alarms started to go off, we asked what was going on. They all just smiled and didn't say a word. Um, so you have no idea what happened. Uh, it was very interesting. But we actually compared data from our archives with data from their archives. And it was the first time, actually, that an analysis had been done from the Russian to the US archives. We're still uh, in, in collaboration with each other. Here are some results I'm going to show you. And you know, I'm not a scientist if I, if I don't show you results. I know that these are, this is going to make a world of sense to you. I know you can read every little line that's on here. Um, but, but let me just tell you the, the take home message. One of my students compiled all the data from 120,000 mice from our data set of 49,000 in the European database, which included a large number as well, and looked at the survival against dose for all these animals. He also looked at dose rate effects for some of these. What you notice is, of course, increase the dose, animals die. No, no, no surprise there. But what he did find was that there were some things that showed exceptions. These were animals that were exposed when they were very young, died sooner than animals that were older. And he used this analysis to try to understand some dose rate effects. I had another student who did um, an experiment to ask uh, the, the effect. Um, to ask the question, what is the effect of a CT scan? Now, we can't ask the effect of a CT scan. It's way too low a dose. We can't look at it. Um, these are the actual data. These are the model data. She looked at the survival against time. And you can see that each one of these is given at a different dose rate. What matters is Look at the red line. The red line there is the un untreated animal. That's when normal untreated mice die. This second kind of olive-ish line that's next, that's the equivalent of a mouse getting one CT scan every day of its life. OK? So one CT scan every day causes that effect. So it's not that dramatic for every day. Imagine how little it would be from just one CT scan in your lifetime, but that would suggest it's not really so damaging. The next study that she did was to actually look not at um, gamma ray exposure like we've been doing, which is the common exposure, but she looked at neutrons, which come from atomic bombs. And she showed some interesting results with that. I'm not going to go into this in detail because it gets um, too confusing, but I will tell you that what was shocking was that everybody believed that the dose rate effect that I talked about earlier only works with one quality of radiation. It looks like it works with all kinds of radiations. Now, we have an interesting study um, where we did a comparison between animals that were bred in Japan that are recent and our animals that were bred out down at Argonne. And we asked the question, if they're radiation exposed, do they die of different things because they're living in a different animal facility you know, 4,000 miles away? And probably about 30 to 40 years different in time. And the answer was, you know what? They die of the same cancers. They die about the same times. What are the only things that show differences? Respiratory illness, not lung cancer, but respiratory illness and GI illness. Now, what would be the differences there? Differences in ventilation, differences in lab chow that the animals are eating, but the cancers were all the same. That means that there's a huge consistency from one to the other. Uh, let's see. I've, I've got about five more minutes left. So let me talk about the dog studies now. Now, I'm a dog lover. I have two dogs. I keep these archives so that no dog need die again. We ship samples all over the world to people that want to understand radiation effects on dogs. Um, so these were done. There are some amazing dog studies. Probably the most important thing I can tell you is the animals at Argonne 
Uh, they used the beagle dog. The beagles lived 23 years. Um, how did they live to be 23 years? Some of them were radiation exposed animals that got a very low dose rate. They lived 23 years because they took such very good care of their dogs. Um, they were doing health checks on them almost every day and it was absolutely remarkable. Um, they were all lifespan studies, so they irradiated the dog and waited to see how long it lived. They did 7,000 dogs per site. Nobody is gonna do this large an experiment with dogs again. It's, it's not affordable, it's not possible to do it, and the thing that's most amazing is that they coordinated them all together so they could actually compare the dogs very easily. And this just shows the source of beagle dog. So here's, here's a tissue from one of these dogs. This is um, a mammary gland. The animal got a mammary tumor. And you can see here the radiation. Do you see these black spots? These black spots are radiation inside the mammary gland, uh, gland of this dog that's giving, getting a, a tumor. But here's um, the most interesting thing that we, we learned. When we give radiation exposure to these dogs, their age, of course, the more exposure you get, the more that they die. But each one of these different exposures is at a different dose rate. The animals that died the most are at a high dose rate. The animals that died the least are at a low, uh, uh, are, are at a low dose rate. And here's the example um, of these animals. Please, this is, this is like really important. This might, this might change the universe here. We looked at risk of getting the, at, we looked at cancer incidence against time after exposure. This line here is the unexposed animal. This is the animal that got a very low dose rate exposure. These of course got high dose rate exposures. But I want you to look at this one, where there's almost no difference between the dog that got no exposure and the dog that got a low dose rate exposure. Even better, look at this one where the dog that got exposed lived longer than the dog that didn't get exposed. There's something here to be understood. Um, I'm not gonna say go out and get exposed to radiation, it's good for you, but I will say that it's much more complicated than we think, particularly at low dose rates. There may be something going on there that we just don't know. It does look like there's an immune stimulation that might be partially responsible, but um, it suggests that radiation may not be as damaging as we think. Um, this, is, this will be my final slides because I don't want to go too much over my time. I want to leave a little bit for questions. Um, we now have an instrument at Argonne National Laboratory at the Advanced Photon Source where we can look for at these samples. We can look at sections. This happens to be um, from a lymph node of an animal that was exposed. And we can look for silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, all the elements on the periodic table we can look at. Here is silicon. Why, do we, why are we looking for silicon? Because this experiment, they gave the dogs their radiation in a silicon bead. So where we're seeing silicon, that's where the dog got its radiation. It was in a silicon bead. Um, there's almost always iron wherever we see the silicon beads. We think that's because um, immune cells have a lot of iron and they're picking it up. But here's perhaps the most exciting thing is the presence of zirconium. We are not seeing yttrium. These dogs were given Y90, yttrium. What are we seeing? The daughter products of Y90 after 30 or 40 years of radioactive decay, which is zirconium. So this is good evidence that we can actually pick up exactly where the radiation went in the dog. We can try to figure out what is ongoing for that dog and what its um, exposures are. Now, I have a bunch of stuff that I could do about other incidents and accidents. I'm, just, I'm gonna do just a quick one or two minutes on these and then I'll, I'll be happy to um, take some questions. I don't know how many of you know about uh, the Marshall Islands. The US did the majority of our testing of atomic bombs on the, at the Marshall Islands. We, the, in this example, this is one of the accidents, no, one of the incidents, where they blew up a bunch of ships with an atomic bomb to see whether it would um, whether it would uh, blow or not. This is another such incident, and this was called the Baker test. This is the Trinity explosion where they looked at the first like nanoseconds after uh, the explosion, and uh, this is the explosion at 10 minutes. But what's the consequence? 
The consequence was that these people, that this was the ground zero, the people that lived here were given exposures that were lethal. And the people that lived out here were given exposures that were able to, that would cause cancer. So the US has been paying reparations to the Marshall Islands for decades now because of what damage we did to them in the, in the course of testing our nuclear weapons on that site. Um, I, I'm not going to talk, I could talk about selected criticality accidents, but otherwise I won't leave enough time uh, for questions. I will mention this one because Mladen's in the audience. Uh, he will have heard of the Vincha reactor uh, where there was uh, an accident. I actually got to meet with several of the people that were involved in the accident. Here's Tito. Um, here's the hospital where several of them were treated with bone marrow transplants, first bone marrow transplants ever, ever given. And here they are celebrating the success of the bone marrow transplants. Here, are, here they are coming back from the accident uh, with the successful uh, 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 bone marrow transplants. And here are the um, physicians being heralded in the Serbian news for being uh, heroes. Uh, there are many, many other such incidents. They do not, however, there are only normally three or four people in each case, so they don't make up a lot to help us understand uh, radiation effects. Um, I think with that I'll end, um, but I'm, I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Walsh, you can read to, it, to answer some questions. And, uh, There are mics on both sides, so please line up before behind those mics. Uh, introduce yourselves and ask ask any questions. And Dr. Walsh said that she will field those questions herself. So please go ahead. Yeah, and I, I'm happy to talk about anything you want to know about radiation. I mean, I kind of live in a radiation world an awful lot of the time. Don't be shy, please. It's like no fun for the speaker if people don't ask questions. You know that. Okay, hello, my name is Julia. I was at the lunch earlier. Um, this was very inspiring to see what you've learned and what you can share with us. So coming from you, who is very inspirational, um, I would like to know who inspires you to do research like this. Yeah, the, I will tell you that I had a lot of very important people in my life who helped me. Um, there, there was a woman, Helen Evans, she's passed away since. She was at Case Western Reserve University. She was alive in the days when they had horse and buggies in Ohio. Um, and she, uh, she really encouraged me. You know, it, sometimes you get discouraged as a junior scientist starting out. She was a big, big inspiration to me and really encouraged me. But then let me say that we can also derive fr things from young people. So this project that I'm showing you uh, with the dog study, this study was not, it, it was something I had wanted to do forever. But what happened to me was a very young scientist came up to me at a conference and said, Gail, we need to put together a project to do this, 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 your study. I can do the pharmacokinetics. I think there are other people that can do other parts. So she put together the pharmacokinetics. I thought about it and got a guy in who could do, do, do dosimetry. We ha had a person out in California we knew that was working on a drug to treat um, ra radiation illness. and. Um, we put together the grant and we got two, one from the Department of Defense and one from National Institutes of Health, all because of her inspiration. So she's the person that pulled that, that really started that and started out that idea. So young people can be inspirations as well. It's not just your older colleagues that do it. Um, so that was important to me. Hi, my name is Dave Hawkins, a biochem student. So one question that I had I was wondering about was medical, medical instruments that use radiation to cure various diseases and cancer, are those, can those harm you just as much as those diseases that they are trying to cure? Really good question. Um, so first of all, um, those instruments are calibrated very well. 
So they should be giving a dose only very specifically to the tumor, for instance, when they're doing tumor treatment. There are other things that are treated with radiation, but that's the major thing that we're treating is, is, is the tumor. They're calibrated very well, and our, our most recent approaches to doing radiation treatment allow for multiple beams to come multiple beams to come together so that we get all our radiation in one spot, okay? So the consequences are not always that damaging. What's the problem that the physician faces? Honestly, they can kill any cancer that walks through their door, but they can give a dose that also kills the patient. So what's the problem? You know, you have a, you have a lung tumor, it gets surrounding tissue, you have lung damage, and then you can't breathe anymore. What good did it do, right? It did no good if, you, if the patient can't breathe after you're done treating them. So physicians know that, radiation oncologists know that, and I, I help them work through that. And the idea is to give the dose, the best dose to kill the tumor, but to not do too much harm to the patient. Will there be side effects? Probably. Um, but will the patient have you know, life-saving treatment very often that will be the case. So it's a balance, actually, and it's a very difficult balance. The second problem with radiation is the story I showed you about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. When you're exposed to radiation, there is, there's a, a, a background incidence of cancer that comes from the radiation alone. Now, I will tell you honestly, my oncology colleagues get very mad at me. Most most um, chemotherapies are much more damaging than radiation. Everybody I know calls me and they're like, Gail, I'm gonna get radiation, this is terrible, what's gonna happen? The fact is most chemos are much more damaging for causing secondary cancers than radiation is. But it does happen. It can happen in some incidences. There are examples. So for instance, uh, especially children who are treated for a pretty rare tumor of the eyeball called retinoblastoma, where does the radiation go? It goes back here. They often get um, bone tumors right in the back of their skull. Um, it's, it's the risk of, of radiation, it's, it, it, it's sad, but that's the best we can do right now. Um, hi, I'm Diane Chambers. Thank you for coming to speak with us. This is all very interesting. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk, uh, if there are certain Talk about certain advances that have been made in technology in terms of delivering radiation treatment more precisely. And if, that's, if it's true, then what are some of the most recent advances that you think have been most useful? Yeah, probably the most important uh, development is the use of protons. So everything I've talked about here are mostly uh, for photons. So there are going to be um, electrons that are going to be damaging. But um, about oh seven or eight years ago, well, certainly for, since the 1960s, people have been studying protons as a particular way to, to, to treat. What are protons? They're small little particles that are positively charged that go around our, our uh, that go around the um, element, the nucleus of the element, right? You remember this from like high school uh, uh, chemistry or even maybe before that. And so we target the tumor with protons. Protons have um, unique features that make them be different than uh, standard photons are. What's, what are the unique features? When you give a photon, it comes in and it goes down like this. But photons can penetrate the entire body, and that's why they can give you a dose of photons to treat a cancer. But what protons do is they have a different depth for dose distribution. That means they go in at a low dose, they peak inside the person, and then they come down. So I want you to think about prostate cancer, for instance, okay? What's the, what's the tissue that comes after the prostate in most men? The rectum. Get bad treatment of the rectum, what's gonna happen? You're gonna have a miserable life. So protons actually go in at a low dose, you put the main dose into the rectum, into the prostate, and then by the time you get to the rectum, there's no dose left. That doesn't happen with photons. So you can reduce some of the side effects by using protons. They're also very useful in children who are going to live, live more than 20 years, we hope, after treatment, so it reduces secondary cancers. Now, one treatment that's on the horizon is um, what we call heavy ion therapy. 
So we do not have a facility in the U.S. to do this. They're talking about building it. We used to have some capabilities at Argonne. Uh, there were also some capabilities out in California. We can talk about why the U.S. shut down all their facilities. I think it was stupid. Um, they didn't ask my advice. Um, and even so, they probably wouldn't have listened had they asked. But what happened is that Germany and Japan have both been using carbon ions. So there are protons, which are positively charged. They're carbon ions, which is the nucleus of the carbon atom. So it's kind of heavy. And it's what we call heavy charged particle. And that, too, has that feature of being able to go in, have a peak, and then come out. But it actually is more damaging than the proton is. So Heidelberg has had some really good success with treatment of cancers with carbon. Um, Japan has been doing it for a very long time. And I hear rumors that the US may be building a facility down in, uh, at the Mayo Clinic down in Jacksonville, down in Florida. Um, so there might be some carbon here in the US. But again, why we, we, we were the first ones that developed carbon sources. Why we dropped the ball on it, why we're not the pioneers in that, I have no idea. Um, I know they're exp it's expensive to maintain it, and you know, unfortunately, that, that's what hurt us. So those are the things I think we're going to be seeing is the use of the carbon. Now, all that said, the other thing that's pretty amazing is that we're getting the dosimetry is getting better and better and better, so that we can pinpoint those beams much better than we could um, ever do it before. So the, you know, those are the changes that are taking place. I will also mention, you know, I'm hard to shut me up once I get talking. I'll mention one other, and it's a technique called flash. Um, that's what we call it in the field. And it's where instead of giving the radiation at the regular dose rate, you go to an ultra high dose rate, so high that it like goes in a nanosecond. And there are a lot of data showing that you get great killing of the tumor, but you don't get any normal tissue damage when you do flash. So I was just out in California a little while ago. There's a company that's building a flash instrument. I think we're going to get one here in Chicago, but the problem is, we don't know how it, why it works. Um, and we don't know what conditions it works in. And we don't know long-term effects. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done before we're going to be able to put this in, into people. I don't want to go over my time, but there was another question. I don't want to skip anybody. Hello, doctor. Um, I was at the lunch today, too. and. Uh, I, I think I remember you talking about animals and your like your government contract or something like that. I just wanted to ask a very, um, it, it's rather elementary, but like what ethical uh, practices uh, do you like? You know, what what does it lead to you when you're working on research work? What do you what do you like? You know, what are your guidelines for that, especially ethically? Yeah, I mean, first of all, because these animals were experimented on a long time ago. We don't have to worry about ethics issues. They already sacked all these animals. All we have are tissues. But we do do some work in the lab with new animals. And we're required to fill out what's called an animal care and use form, where we have to go through, sometimes for months, all the little steps that, we're going to take, that are going to take place. So we, do, we actually do some experiments with rabbits um, that we put in the patient irradiator um, in order to get uh, what we're trying to look, it's what would I do for my nanotechnology pro project. And um, we go through huge protocols. You have to anesthetize the animals a particular way. Um, you, you have to watch them for days after they've been exposed. Um, you have to have people with them all the time. Because we're using patient irradiators, we have additional protocols. The patients don't know that bunnies are being treated in their facility at night or on Saturdays. Um, you have to really make sure you mop up right so that there are no uh, signs that there were uh, rabbits in there, and, um, and, and, and almost all steps that you might do, the housing, everything has to be approved. These forms are like this thick. I mean, and they're mostly on paper, not in just files. So yeah, thanks for asking that. It's a hard, it's yeah. hard. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. You know, in, in this past year with um, the sad Ukrainian war situation, there's been a lot of discussion about um, attacks, battles going on near um, nuclear plants. So how much of a risk do you think there is? Yeah, I, I, I'm Ukrainian. Um, I've been to Chernobyl many times. I know there's a Parisia plant to some extent, and I get because I'm on a UN committee for the scientific effects of radiation, I also work a lot with, I know about the IAEA, so I know a little bit about what they're doing. 
Um, Chernobyl has been a real mess. Um, what, what the Russians did there, I mean, it was actually unconscionable for their own people. They dug up this area called the Red Forest. The Red Forest uh, was where they had buried all the nuclear waste from Chernobyl. And I, I guess the Russians didn't know it was there. They dug trenches. They lay, laid in those trenches for like two months. Now, a little bit of exposure, a couple of hours, it's not going to be too bad. But a month? I mean, they're going to get radiation sickness from the doses that exist there. And in fact, many of them did, and they had to be treated. They took them to Belarus to um, one of the old Chernobyl hospitals to, to treat them. Um, the Zaporizhia plant, uh, the current word on the street, I don't know how true this is, I haven't had it very verified, is that the damage to that plant is so extensive that it may never be useful again. Um, and then what happens is we have to like worry about what to do with the spent fuel rods, with uh, how to handle the radiation that's there. And that's a huge amount of energy for Europe to be um, you know, without. So it's, it's very damaging. They were shelling the plant. There were, there were several times when IEA was called in because they were worried about damage. Um, it seems like there's just no regard for um, any kind of safety at all. And the Russian soldiers that were at Chernobyl, there was no regard for even their safety. So they weren't caring for the Russian soldiers, much less um, anybody else. It's, it, it's a very sad um, situation. I don't know how it's going to end up. I, I have a, a Ukrainian refugee who lives with me. My cousin is here uh, from Ukraine. So I hear the daily reports. Anybody else? Well, look, I'll, I'll hang around a little bit if somebody wants to talk. And my email address was on that first slide, and Mladen also has it. Please feel free to you know bug me anytime. Thank you very much.